welcome back after tea and let us see I am now taking questions not only on open systems, but on anything that has happened so far. First I am going to uh, MES Pillai at Panvel. Pillai Panvel over to you. Hello sir, it is uh, regarding question number OS 14 in that we have to determine the final temperature of the air in the body. So we have tried and we have considered the uh, heat, work, kinetic energy and potential energy zero. So the only thing remaining is uh, uh, change in enthalpy. Is our assumption right? And the second, uh, second question is regarding OS 17 in that we have to determine the uh, entropy production rate. So how to proceed for the entropy production rate? Please explain sir. Thank you. I have one question based on OS14. Pillai made an assumption that there is no heat transfer, there is no WS, that is right. They also neglected kinetic energy and potential energy of the air as it flowed in, uh, that is at the entry to the bottle, that also is right. But then they said that the initial enthalpy turns out to be the final enthalpy, which is not right, that means the application is not right. Uh, consider it as a transient process integrated over time. So, if this is the bottle, the bottle is rigid that is given, that is also insulated, it has some volume V naught and it is perfectly evacuated. So, the initial state is vacuum. Uh, let us say this is our control volume. The control volume is inner surface of the bottle and the opening of the bottle through which air goes in. The process will be shown as initially vacuum and finally contains some thing at uh, P1, T1. So, you can say initial state. is 0 final state is say 1 or let me say the initial state is i because not is used and final state is f okay of the system which is open and air goes in at P naught T naught. Now, as we proceed, I will mention the assumptions and that should be noted. Notice that Q equals 0, W s equals 0 okay. and there is one inlet and there is no exit. First, conservation of mass. This is going to be trivial, but let us go through it. Conservation of mass is d m c v by d t is m dot i minus m dot e. There is no exit, so this term is gets dropped out. It is not that we are putting it to 0, that term just does not exist. Now, integrate this over time of filling. That means, from the time of opening of the bottle up to the time where you close the bottle stopper is replaced when the flow stops. Now, when the flow stops, remember the outer pressure will have to be equal to the inner pressure. We do not know what the temperature would be, but when you integrate this, this will give you mass of the final state in the bottle minus mass at the initial state of the bottle equals the mass which has entered the bottle. I am writing in it just to not to confuse it with m i, but this initial mass is 0 because it is vacuum. Okay. So, we get the final mass, mass in the bottle equal to the mass which has entered, that is what I said it is trivial. 
because we know if initially it contains nothing, nothing goes out of it, then what goes in would be what is there in the bottle. Now, let us apply first law. Let me write it in reasonably full form d e c v by d t is q dot minus w dot s plus m dot i into h i plus v i squared by 2 plus g z i, I am not writing those terms, minus m dot e in similar h etcetera, but this we do not have to bother because nothing goes out. Now, this is h i plus v i squared by 2 plus g z i. Okay. Now, before integrating let us simplify, it is a rigid bottle. So, all work done would be the flow work which would be included in the enthalpy, this work is 0, because it cannot expand contract, there is no mention of a stirrer or an electric worker or anything like that. It is insulated, so this will also be 0. So, the assumptions rigid and insulated are invoked here. Okay. Now, let me go to another page. Now, if you integrate this, you will get E control volume final minus E control volume initial equal to, now this is integral of m dot i h i plus whatever v i squared by 2 plus g z i d t over the time when you open the bottle and then you close the bottle. Now, we do not have to worry about how to do this integral. Let us assume that at the inlet state, the state is dictated by P naught T naught and hence the inlet enthalpy will be the ambient enthalpy of air, that is one thing. And second thing, let us neglect V inlet squared by 2 and G z inlet compared to the uh, center of mass of the bottle, because this, this z inlet will not be the absolute z inlet, it will be the relative z inlet. On the left hand side, the, the initial energy is 0, it is only the final energy. So, what you end up here is the final energy is the final mass, which is m f. Now, here this will be u f plus other components of energy, just the way we have neglected this component of the coming air, let us neglect this component of the final state, potential energy and kinetic energy. Now, on the right hand side, if we neglect this and say this remains h naught, the right hand side simply becomes the mass which has come in into h naught the mass which has come in is m i into h naught. So, the final form of the equation, energy equation is this. From the conservation of mass, we have m f equal to m i that cancel out. So, you simply end up with u f equals h naught and all that I will do is write this as right hand side h is u plus p v p naught v naught. So, we end up with this relation u f minus u naught is p naught v naught. And now, we use the assumption or make the assumption that I do not think it is given here, that we will assume that air is an ideal gas with constant C p C v. And in that case, we will end up with u f minus u naught is C v into T f minus T naught equal to P naught V naught is R T naught. And you take T naught on one side, you will get T naught into C v plus R which equals C p and finally, you will get T f is C p by C v into T naught and this is what we know as gamma. So, this will be gamma into T naught. 
this is OS 14 continued. I hope this explains it in reasonable detail. Over to you. Sir, uh, question number OS uh, 17 in that uh, entropy production rate is to be determined. How to proceed with question? Thank you. Yes, the second question is about one of the heat exchanger questions. Now, although we do it uh, manage heat, trans heat exchangers in uh, heat transfer, the thermodynamic way of managing heat exchangers is as follows. Uh, let us say, I what I am writing will be good also for OS 18. So, this is the heat exchanger type of situation. Now, from a thermodynamic point of view, a heat exchanger, a typical heat exchanger will have a hot stream going in and coming out, another stream known as the cold stream going in and coming out and the two streams do not mix. That is the typical transfer type of heat exchanger. Okay. It could be tube in tube, shell and tube, compact, parallel flow, cross flow. From thermodynamic point of view, let us say there is fluid 1 which goes in and goes out and fluid 2 which also goes in and goes out. And let us say this is one inlet and this is one exit and this is two inlet and two exit. I am not making any assumption that it is parallel flow or counter flow. I am just schematically showing an inlet and exit, you can free, you are free to show it anywhere. And our main control volume is the full heat exchanger. And as in, ca in the case of the standard heat exchanger theory, we assume that the full heat exchanger is insulated. We also assume that there is no stirrer or anything or extracting of power. So, W dot S is also 0. Okay. We will assume that a steady state exists. Now, this becomes a two stream or two inlet, two exit, no mixing type of situation. This is absolutely horrible. I think I should shift there. My G is just, whereas the G which I drew is like this, it is shown, showing it like this. Okay. okay. So, with this our first law steady state q dot minus w dot s is and we will also assume that delta E k delta E p are negligible for either stream. So, this becomes m dot i h i sorry this is a steady state. So, m dot e h e summed over the two streams minus m dot i h i summed over the two streams. Since this is 0 and this is 0, this can be written down as by expanding this m dot 1 h 1 e minus h 1 i plus m dot 2 h 2 e minus h 2 i equal to 0. Okay. Now, since there are two terms summing up to 0, this the, the heat transfer people will call energy balance or heat balance of the heat exchanger. 
okay. we call it the first law of thermodynamics for the open system to inlet to exit no mixing as applied to this heat exchanger. Now, remember that this is made up of two terms and the sum is 0. So, naturally one of these two terms, one of these two terms will be positive, the other term will be negative with the same magnitude. There is no choice unless both of them are 0 and if both of them are 0 that means, H 1 e is H 1 i, H 2 e is H 2 i the state is not changing or the mass flow rates are 0 that means, it is not a heat exchanger of interest to us. So, let us say that one is a one term is positive and one term is negative. The term which is for which H 2 e minus H 2 i is positive will be called the cold side. Its enthalpy increases as it flows through the heat exchanger. This will be called the hot side. The enthalpy of the hot side decreases as it goes through the heat exchanger. Okay. Now, I have just assumed that the side 2 is the cold side and side 1 is the hot side, but if I just call them 1 and 2, uh, anything can be hot and anything can be cold. So, let me say that this is my first equation, which is the overall energy balance. Heat, and heat transfer people will write it as uh, m dot i heat transfer people will write it as m dot i h 1 uh, i minus h 1 e equal to m dot 2 h 2 e minus h 2 i, but it is essentially this equation which they are writing. Now, uh, you have to determine heat transferred between the streams. Now, for heat transfer between the streams, it is necessary for us to consider the heat exchanger split into two control volumes. One is the upper control volume, let me call it C V 1 and second one is the lower control volume C V 2. Upper and lower is in this figure, but the actual requirement is that the control volume 1 and 2 should totally create our full control volume for which we wrote this. There should not be any gaps or overlaps and control volume 1 uh, would contain, will not contain anything of stream 2, control volume 2 will not contain anything of stream 1. And since we are assuming a steady state and the, because of that the thermodynamic properties of the structure of the heat exchanger do not come into operation. Every part of the non-fluid structure and non-fluid components of the heat exchanger in steady state would be maintaining their state, maintaining their temperature. So, there is no question of any energy transfer to or from them. Okay. So, now when you look at these two uh, control volumes, we can now write an energy balance for any one of them or for each one of them. Let us say that the uh, energy transfer in the form of heat from the hot fluid to the cold fluid. U dot of that heat exchanger. Okay. And now, I apply first law to say C V 1. So, first law C V 1 will be the heat outflowing. If you look at the control volume, the outflowing heat is q dot h x, what goes in and out is m dot 1, inlet enthalpy is h 1 i, 
outlet enthalpy is H 1 E. So, you end up with heat absorbed is minus Q dot heat exchanger equals M dot 1 into H 1 E minus H 1 I. And if you apply this to control volume 2, you will get it absorbs Q dot H x. I am not writing it here, but you will get if you want you write plus Q dot x H x is M dot 2 into H 2 E minus H 2 I. Okay. And either using this equation 2 or equation 3, any one of them can be used to determine Q dot H x that is the heat transferred between the stream and this heat transferred between the stream or rate of heat transfer between the stream is what the heat exchanger people call the duty of the heat exchanger. And now the entropy production rate, for entropy production rate you consider the full H x as the control volume. that is what we saw on the earlier page, the full control volume from which contains both the streams. And this is an adiabatic control volume. So, the uh, second law applied to a steady open system, an adiabatic control volume would give you S dot P equals sigma M dot E S E minus sigma M dot I S I. Expanding this, this will become for us M dot 1 S 1 E minus S 1 I plus m dot 2 s 2 e minus s 2 i. This is equation 4. Unlike equation 1, remember for equation 1, it is a similar equation in terms of enthalpies, but the other side is 0. Here the entropy production equation, if you look at it, the right hand side of 4 is very similar to the left hand side of 1, enthalpy is replaced by entropy that is about it, but the other side is not 0, it is S dot P and we must have S dot P greater than or equal to 0. Otherwise, the heat exchanger as specified, one will not be able to work in practice, it is not a possible situation. Uh, in either 17 or 18, enough information is available for us to determine the end states. Maybe one of the end states is not given or end enthalpy is not given. Use our overall uh, equation of energy balance or first law for determining either some m dot 1 or m dot 2 may be missing or one of the four enthalpies may be missing that unknown can be determined from this equation. And once you determine on enthalpies, either the pressures must be given or the you can neglect pressure drop if no information is provided, make that as an additional assumption. And that means, you know the inlet and exit states of each stream and calculate the entropy difference between inlet and exit for stream 2, inlet and exit for stream 1, substitute in this equation equation 4 then will be solved for the unknown S dot P. I hope that satisfies you. Over to you. Sir, only uh, temperatures are given in this question and uh, we are told to neglect the loss of pressure. So, only with uh, temperature how to calculate the entropy? Um, in 17, it is given that air is heated from 30 to 80 degrees C and for the second uh, air it is uh, 150 degrees C. 
So, assume air to be an ideal gas with constant specific heats. In which case, you can use terms like both uh, both streams are air, right? Yes, in OS seventeen, both streams are air. So you can write H one E minus H one I equals C P into T one E minus T one I. And similarly for H 2 E and H 2 I, uh, because if you assume ideal gas, then enthalpy does not depend on pressure. So, you do not have to neglect pressure for this, but S 1 E minus S 1 I, this will become C P L N T 1 E by T 1 I. There would be a minus R L N P 1 E minus P 1 I, but this requires neglect delta P between 1 I and 1 E. And similar equations you can write for the second stream and that way you can now the all the details of the problems including the property relations are clear to you. Over. Thank you so much sir, over and out. Amrita Coimbatur, over to you. Good evening, sir. I am Ravindran from Amrita. Today morning I asked one question regarding our uh, test 2 about adiabatic process. Uh, the question paper itself uh, state that uh, all four statements are correct. Can you explain, sir? Can you identify, sir? Yes. I am taking over. This was the one question from test 2. Uh, the question was that uh, an adiabatic process and the choices were can it be P equals constant? That was I think one choice. Another choice is can it be V equal to constant? Yes. Third choice was can it be P V equals constant? And the fourth choice was can it be P V raise to gamma equals constant? And the, the I think the standard answer given was all four are possible. Am I right in my understanding of the question? Over. All four statements are correct. Okay, now I will demonstrate how that is possible. First thing, let us get rid of. Let me say this is A, this is B, this is C and this is D. I think most of you have uh, uh, answered P V raise to gamma is constant. Now, that is because the our first derivation of an adiabatic process is for a quasi static adiabatic process for an ideal gas with constant specific heats in which only P D V work is done. Refer to question F 1 uh, F 1.6. Here, if C is 0, you will end up with P V raise to gamma is constant. So, D everyone knows is possible, but under what condition? You have an ideal gas constant C P C V, of course, adiabatic process. Quasi-static process, otherwise you cannot 
integrate that equation okay and not only that only p d v work no stirrer work or anything like that in under all these condition it, you are if you implement all these conditions really you are really executing a adiabatic reversible process and then that is isentropic process for which p v raise to gamma is constant. Now, let us consider A or before that let me consider B which is easier to show. Okay. Adiabatic process in which volume is constant. Consider a rigid insulated box containing some gas, some fluid, whatever gas, vapor, any fluid will do. It is rigid, so V equals constant. If it is well insulated, then it is adiabatic. And how do I execute the process? Adiabatic means work transfer only, V equals C prevents pressure uh, P d V type of work. So, I have stirrer work negative, but W stirrer will be shown in this direction. This is my system which is adiabatic which is constant volume and that is a proper adiabatic constant volume process. So, I have shown that D is possible and B is possible. The next thing we will tackle is A. For A, I will just modify the earlier one say that put it in a cylinder piston arrangement and you apply a constant force equal to the required pressure P naught into area where A is the area of the piston, cross sectional area of the uh, cylinder okay. and assume that the piston is insulated, the cylinder is also insulated. and this is our system. So, it will remain at P naught because that is the constraint on it. So, it is a P equals constant process, it is well insulated. So, it is an adiabatic process and it can be executed by putting in a stirrer as in the earlier case. Of course, along with stirrer work, there will be a P d V work done also, but let any mode of work take place that does not change its characteristic from adiabatic. So, with this way we have taken care of I think choices, uh, three of the four choices. The only choice which remains is choice C, P v equals constant. This looks like an isothermal process of an ideal gas, but then all that I do is the following. I take a similar thing, but I modify it now. Instead of a f equals p naught a, F is adjustable, the in fact that is the only modification, otherwise everything else remains the same and here hence because F is adjustable, P will be changing and if I allow it to expand, 
there will be W expansion which is greater than 0. I provide a uh, W stirrer which is less than 0 and W expansion would be P d V or F d X. I adjust my F. Remember that if I reduce my F slightly, my pressure will reduce as it uh, expands because uh, there has to be a force balance on this and all I need to do in this case is adjust, okay, I will simplify this by putting this to be the fluid to be an ideal gas with constant C P C V and if I adjust my W S T plus W expansion okay, uh, to be 0. It is insulated, so it is adiabatic, so Q equals 0. There is no other work, so my total work is 0, my total Q is 0 and hence my change in energy as the process takes place is 0. And since it is stationary and a slow quasi static process, I can neglect, uh, there will be no change in potential and kinetic energy. So, delta E equals 0 will imply delta e equals 0 by first law, delta U equals 0 because I know there will be no change in kinetic and potential energy, and delta U equals 0 along with ideal gas, that fluid being an ideal gas with constant specific heats will give me delta T is 0 or change in temperature to be 0. So, by adjusting this F in such a way that W stirrer plus W expansion is 0, in this otherwise adiabatic system, I am executing an isothermal process which for an ideal gas would mean P V equals constant. I think that should satisfy your curiosity. NIT Calicut, over to you. The tutorial sheet page number 10, 5.8. How do I determine alpha in that? Tutorial sheet page number 10, page number 10. Question number 5.8. How do I evaluate the alpha? is equal to 1, is equal to minus 1 over V, 2 by 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 2 three different temperatures and three different pressures. So, you have uh, values at pressure of 6.57 and 7.5 bar and temperatures of uh, 490, 500 and 510. Okay. But the data is available only at these 5 points. The properties are H, V and S apart from P and T. So, that means you can determine something with respect to temperature at constant pressure, this can be calculated. Similarly, something at constant pressure at varying with pressure at constant temperature can be calculated. Okay. Now, when it comes to uh, uh, things like C V, you need a constant uh, volume line. Similarly, when you need alpha, 
you need a constant entropy line. So, for alpha uh, convert partial of V into P at constant S to uh, derivatives uh, at constant T or constant T. What I recommend is uh, there are two chain rules in uh, partial differentiation and you should remember those, they come in handy. Uh, use One is the simpler one, the variable t is not one of x, y and z. Okay. And the second one which is known as the cyclic rule, in fact that comes in handy quite often is delta x partial of x with respect to y at constant z into partial of y with respect to z at constant x into partial of z with respect to x at constant y equals minus 1. Remember this minus sign. You may use this plus Maxwell's relations as needed to convert uh, partial of V with respect to P at constant S, you should be straight away able to convert into partial of V with respect to P at constant T and I think you get it in terms of this and C P and C V. It is possible to get this and it is not a very complicated formula, it is some in the three or four steps, half a page of algebra calculus you should be able to get this. Once you do that, you need only uh, temperature derivatives and you are able to uh, solve the problem, obtain the numericals. Over to you, try it out. KK Vag Nashik. Uh, over to you. Sir, my question is on OS 9. Yes, sir, the first part of the problem is okay, but only the second part, if we define the ideal pump as the one which does the pumping isothermally, what is the efficiency of the pump? That I am not getting. Over to you, sir. In OS 9, we have a water pump which uh, for which the inlet state is given, exit pressure is given, power consumption is given and uh, the mass flow rate, I mean volume flow rate is given at inlet condition. So, essentially indirectly the mass flow rate is given. So, if you say this is our pump, open control volume it will have one inlet 
the inlet is at 1 bar 25 degree C, the exit is as 180 bar and it consumes 75 kilowatt of power. So, W dot S is minus 75 kilowatt and uh, uh, calculate the m dot, m dot is determine the density at 1 bar 25 degree C, uh, multiply that by the volume flow rate which is 12000 liter per hour. So, you will get it in liters per second and then in kg per second. If you uh, look at the P T diagram, you are going at 1 bar 25 degree C. At 1 bar, the saturation temperature is almost 100 degree C. So, 1 bar 25 degree C is the inlet state I. Apply first law, assume steady state, neglect heat transfer, assume it to be a reasonably insulated pump, neglect delta E k delta E p and you will simply end up with, if this is the exit state, this will be the process and this will be the pressure, exit pressure which is given as 180 bar. So, use first law and you will end up with q dot which is 0 minus w dot s which is given to be 75 kilowatt minus 75 kilowatt. So, this will be plus 75 kilowatt. This will be m dot which we have calculated multiplied by h e minus h i and uh, H i is known because the inlet state is known, you will get H e and H e and P e, these two parameters now fix the exit state and hence you are able to determine the exit state. Okay. And the second part of the question is, uh, the ideal pump is defined as one which does the pumping isothermally, if we define. That means, now consider a case where the exit state is say, you know, let me instead of E, let me call it F. This would be the ideal pump. The exit state would now be 180 bar and 25 degree C. Okay. So, assume this to be the exit state determine how much is the power required and the ratio, the ratio of that ideal power and the actual power would be the efficiency of the pump. I hope that explains it. Over to you. My one more question is there on uh, OS 13, sir. Uh, I want to know something about uh, throttling calorimeter. In throttling calorimeter, we are taking enthalpy before throttling is equal to enthalpy after throttling. But uh, there is no consideration of the velocity of the steam, sir, for a throttling calorimeter. Over to you, sir. Uh, when it comes to throttling calorimeter, we will have to explain to the students what is actually meant by throttling calorimeter. If we have a boiler and a throttling calorimeter to go with it, we should show the students that. Uh, I typically draw a figure like this, when there is a flow of wet steam, the measurement of pressure say P i or say P naught, T naught, pressure and temperature which are the two easily measurable parameters are not good enough to fix the state because we know that if P naught and T naught uh, fix the state on the saturation line, then it could be anywhere from saturated liquid to dry saturated vapor. 
So, in this case we uh, uh, use the simplest thing to use is a throttling calorimeter and for that what you do is you put a sampling probe with some holes in it. So, that a representative sample is taken, then it goes through a throttling valve and then it goes through a large expansion chamber. And at the exit of the expansion chamber, we measure the temperature and we measure the pressure, which would be the ambient pressure, okay, because this is usually uh, exhausted to the ambient. But for this, it is expected that P naught is reasonably higher than the ambient to be able to give us some flow. If P naught is near the ambient or is at ambient pressure, then we will have to use a vacuum pump here to get a low enough P naught for the flow. Our control volume here is this throttling calorimeter including the valve up to the exit condition. So, the inlet condition is what is sampled, a small sample is taken out. So, m dot is small, this is the exit condition where p exit and t exit is measured and the whole thing is well insulated. It is a rigid structure, so no work other than uh, flow work which would be taken care of by enthalpy. So, our W dot s is 0 and Q dot s is also made negligibly small. Okay. Now, it is a small contraption. So, delta E p is essentially 0 and the m dot is small and here we provide a large area and hence we can well assume that delta E k is also pretty small. Okay. Here the density will be larger, so even if there is a smaller area does not matter, but here the density will be smaller, so we provide a large area to keep our velocities within check. And with this, if you assume steady state, then our uh, first law for open system reduces to simply h i equals h e. That is what you write down, I have not written, but you write down the first law fully second uh, for steady state and put q dot equals 0, w dot s equal to 0, neglect delta e k, delta e p and you will be able to reduce that to this form. And then you might as well show them the sketch of our H s diagram. You show this is one excellent opportunity to make direct use of the, but at least for visual purposes of the Molière diagram H s and the, uh, this is the G line and if let us say this is the ambient pressure P e and this is the pressure at which the sample is taken and let us say we have wet steam and with throttling you have the do not draw it as a continuous line. You say this is the inlet state, the exit state is at the same enthalpy, uh, showing it a continuous line will give an impression that it is a quasi static process, which it may not be, because as it comes out of the throttling, there will be a lot of uh, flashing, a lot of churning, that large chamber is needed to quieten it down, so that we can make a proper measurement of temperature and pressure. Okay. And we know pressure at exit, we measure now the temperature at exit and E is hopefully in the superheated zone and hence P e and T e give us H e and from our first law we get H i and then P i and H i give us the dryness fraction at the inlet state. Okay. 
at this stage it is necessary or it will be nice to point out if no student asks you that if the at this pressure P i which is higher than ambient, if the dryness fraction is pretty low, then it is possible that even after throttling it will remain wet steam and in that case we will not be able to determine the dryness fraction at the inlet and the answer is yes, the limit of uh, dryness fraction or moisture that a throttling calorimeter exposed to atmosphere can be measured. That depends on the inlet pressure and if there is too much of a moisture, a pure throttling calorimeter is not useful, some other tricks will have to be used for measuring moisture. Over to you. Thank you very much sir, over and out. I am talking a lot with Hyderabad, good. Over to you Hyderabad, Dr. Brahmara, any questions from your side, over to you. Yes sir, will you please explain about Joel Thompson experiment and inversion curve sir, over to you. Your question pertains to exercise PR9, this is just an analysis, but uh, uh, the Joule Kelvin experiment or Joule Thompson experiment is the uh, experiment which is known as the throttling experiment or in basic books it is known as the porous plug experiment. Joule wanted to characterize all sorts of gases and uh, he noticed by doing such uh, free expansion and porous plug experiments uh, that the internal energy of an ideal gas and also the enthalpy of an ideal gas is independent of pressure. So, and since the internal energy is depending only on temperature, if you reduce the pressure in a throttling process as we saw in the throttling calorimeter, uh, it does not reduce the temperature. Okay. Then they worked with various gases in their state space and they noticed that real gases do not have this Joule Thomson coefficient mu or Joule Kelvin coefficient mu as given in P r 9 to be 0. Once you derive this equation and if you substitute the ideal gas equation within the square brackets on the right hand side, you will find that it turns out to be 0. Okay. And, uh, uh, but they experimented with various gases and found out that uh, for real gases there is a large region of state space where the Joule Thomson coefficient is negative or nearly 0 or slightly negative, uh, but there is a um, small zone where uh, the Joule Thomson coefficient or Joule, co Joule uh, Kelvin coefficient is uh, positive. That uh, zone where the Joule co uh, Kelvin coefficient is positive is of useful is of use because mu is defined as partial of temperature with respect to pressure at constant h. So, if you have a gas at higher pressure and you throttle it through a porous plug or a throttle valve or a capillary, that means execute a change of state at constant h reducing the pressure, the temperature also reduces. So, if this is greater than 0, this implies that H i equals H e, that means throttling process, reduction in P leads to reduction in T and this can be used for cooling things. And in that part of the, in the state space, whichever you write, pressure, temperature, you will find one zone in which mu is greater than 0 and another zone where mu is less than 0. 
the boundary line is for some reason known as the inversion curve or inversion line. That is all about uh, inversion line and uh, the Joule Thomson uh, Joule Kelvin or Joule Thomson coefficient that we need to know. Over to you. Sir, in question number OS 4, uh, semiconductor air compressor, the discharge is given and uh, specific volume at inlet and outlet given. So, at inlet mass flow rate and outlet mass flow rate become different. Over to you, sir. This is a problem in which only the flow work and change in velocity and mass flow rates are to be computed. If you get inlet and exit mass flow rates different, that, that only means that uh, it is not a steady state, but flow rate will be, uh, flow work will be can, can calculated as m dot e p e v e minus m dot i p i v i. If m dot i and m dot e are equal, substitute them to be equal. If m dot i and m dot e are different, substitute them to be different as the actual values. This is a exercise in which, uh, this is a minor exercise in which you do not have to apply the first law. This is only calculation of mass flow rate as rho a v, uh, change in velocity once you calculate the velocity and the flow work given pressure and specific volume. That is it. Over to you. K. K. Vag Nashik, over to you. A well insulated cylinder has perfect vacuum in one half and an ideal gas at pressure P1 in other half. If the partition is broken and the gas occupies the entire volume, then how the pressure P2 is equal to P1 by 2? It is regarding the test 2. Test 2. Yeah. I, uh, it is online test question is there, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am taking over, I think uh, uh, this exactly is C exercise S L point five. I think that question was exactly this. I will show you how to proceed, so that you are clear about it. You have an insulated chamber of volume 2 V 0 divided by a thin rigid partition into two parts of volume V 0 each. Initially, one chamber contains an ideal gas at constant pressure P naught and temperature T naught. The other chamber is evacuated. The partition is suddenly removed and show that when thermal equilibrium is re established, the temperature is T naught and determine the change in entropy, etcetera, etcetera. Here we are not talking about uh, uh, pressure, but just one step to pressure. So, let us sketch the situation. This is a uh, insulated chamber of volume 2 V naught. Initially, it contains an ideal gas in the one half, which is at V naught another half at V naught is evacuated to begin with. And this is let us say it is at P naught and T naught. This partition is broken and the final state would be, I will not show the insulation again, but you sketch it. The final thing is 2 V naught and some P 1 and some T 1. Now, first thing it is a closed system. So, delta E is Q minus W, but it is well insulated. So, Q is 0. Our system boundary is the inside of the chamber. It is rigid, nothing goes across it. So, W is also 0. So, that gives us delta E to be 0. 
since there is no mention of uh, any movement of this delta u will be equal to delta e the other components will not change at all so this will be zero since it is an ideal gas delta u equals 0 implies delta t equals 0 and that means the final temperature t 1 will be the initial temperature t naught. Since the final volume v 1 is 2 v naught, your final pressure p 1 will be p naught by 2 and now since you know the uh, initial state fully t naught v naught p naught and you know the final state fully, you can determine the change in entropy. Over to you. Sir, one more question. This is regarding again uh, uh, online test. The triple point of water is chosen to be 273.16 degree Kelvin because, so your answer is it is uh, as per your convenience. So, how it is sir? Over to you. The question is uh, T triple point of water is defined to be 273.16 Kelvin. This is defined and why is it defined? The answer was our convenience. Now, what is our convenience? Our convenience means, remember that humans are very reluctant to change. So, if we are forced to change from one scheme to another scheme, we will accept it with reluctance and the acceptance of the new scheme will be easier if the change from as you change over from the old scheme to the new scheme, you have to do something very simple, okay. right. Numerically, you must be able to do a simple thing like just divide by 2, multiply by 10 or uh, maybe just add a number. And also, some things which we are happy with or we are comfortable with should remain. So, the, what I was saying was, if you give some arbitrary value say x to the Kelvin temperature of triple point of water, it will turn out that T Celsius is A into T k plus B, where A and B are some complicated, not so complicated, but some functions of this triple point of water. Now, they selected x in such a way that select x such that okay, A is 1. That means, you do not have to multiply anything, you also you, you just have to add something. And when A is selected, uh, sorry x is selected such that A is 1, the value of B turns out to be 273.16. Approximately, there was something here. And then they said that look, if we have to define something, we must be precise. At that time, it was very well established that we can do measurements up to 0 0.01 degrees of temperature difference very precisely. So, it was decided that rather than do this, let us define this to be 273.16 k exactly. So, that is how the current definition of Kelvin scale came about. The current Kelvin scale definition now, now means last few decades is that T triple point of water is 273.16 k exactly. Now, when you do that, remember on the Kelvin scale, 
when you define it to be 273.16 Kelvin exactly, then you are not getting an ice point of 0 degree C and a steam point of 100 degree C okay, or correspondingly on the Kelvin scale. So, because of that to have not to have two definitions, now the C scale is defined as the other way around, C scale is now defined in terms of Kelvin scale. So, temperature on the C scale is now defined as temperature on the Kelvin scale minus 273.16 K. This is definition and the consequence of this definition is now ice point is T ice point is now 0 degree C, which is equal to 273.15 K, we will say almost, but not exactly. Similarly, T steam point, which is 100 degree C is 373.15 K, again almost, but not exactly. The difference is in maybe fourth or fifth place of decimal and we do not have to worry about it. Even physicists do not worry about it, maybe only some standard labs may be looking at it if at all. But because of this definition on the Celsius scale, there is only one temperature which is exact and that is T triple point of water now turns out to be 0 0.01 degree C exactly or you can say it is defined to be 0 0.0.0. 0 ah, this is 270, this is sorry, correct this, this is 15, because this definition of triple point is 16, everywhere else it is 15. I suppose that should explain the, uh, go to Google uh, uh, and search for 1 Kelvin temperature and search for second the international practical temperature scale. Okay. These definitions of scales are ok, but finally for in the laboratories and industry you require a practical definition that means the how do we measure. So, there are even standard methods of measurement of temperatures in various ranges that is uh, specified in what is known as the IPTS international practical temperature scale. There was one in 68, maybe there is one in 79 or 82, I am not sure, but IPTS 68 is uh, reasonably well established. Just look it up and uh, uh, you should be able to get a lot of information about thermometry. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, sir, last question from us. So, this is again on the online topic online test, <coughs> a gas in a rigid container is stirred slowly, it is completely insulated. So, how du is equal to TDS? If you look up our uh, uh, definition of ds, ds is defined as dq by t for any reversible process. Okay. Now, we also showed that this equals d u plus p d v by t. This is definition. This is the application of definition to any fluid that means simple compressible system. So, a, to a gas also this is applicable. Now, you have gas plus rigid uh, vessel. Now, rigid vessel means d v is 0. So, that means d s is d u plus 0 by t and which implies d u equals t d s. And over and out, thank you and that is it for today.